so yeah, I'm, I'm Brittany Trafford and um, uh, I work at Stuart McKelvey and we've been just trying to provide what we can uh, in terms of help for free for Ukrainians. And, and uh, I know that there's a community, a small community in Fredericton. So I'm happy to provide this presentation and help however I, I can, uh, because I know that it's confusing and, um, and it can be a little daunting when you first start looking at the application. So today um, I'm just going to focus, I do have a official PowerPoint because I thought it would help us go through it in a sort of organized fashion. And so I'm going to focus today on what the Canadian Ukraine authorization for emergency travel is, who can apply, and importantly, how do you apply? And then like was mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to, uh, so there was a couple of questions, I think. Um, we're going to cover those um, and I'll try to cover your questions they have tonight, but I have um, encountered frequent questions and my colleagues have too, so I pulled them before, before tonight to just try to come up with some of the things that you might want to ask uh, preemptively. So uh, basically, this is an authorization for emergency travel. Ukrainians require uh, visas to enter Canada, as do some other countries in the world. Uh, but this is a particular uh, emergency stream for them to be able to get a visa in their passport. So it's a simplified process and it has fa much faster processing times. So the end result will be a visa in a passport, which is basically a sticker in a passport or a single journey travel document. I'm going to talk about that a little later, um, but I want to mention it because that's what some people who don't have valid passports right now will end up with. Uh, it is basically an entry document, uh, but it will look a little different than the visa does. Now, it's also important to recognize that this is not a refugee stream. So Ukrainians are coming to Canada through this uh, process and they are not entering and they are not in Canada as refugees. They are seeking refuge, but they're not officially refugees in Canada. Uh, instead, they're going to be considered temporary residents in Canada. So that's a slightly different status. And it's really important to recognize that they're not refugees. And this is not applying for refugee status. I am not a refugee lawyer, but uh, before anybody would look at any uh, at trying to apply for refugee status, I really, really suggest that you consult with a lawyer because it's a very big deal to apply for refugee status. You can't bring it back. And right now we're not really seeing Ukrainians come in through refugee status. They're really coming in through this temporary residence stream. And so that's a really important point. Now, with this, there is an option for the open work permit, um, which is really great. It is free. It will give you status in Canada for three years, is what they're saying right now. They've also announced that uh, Ukrainians who come to Canada are going to be exempt from the vaccination requirements in place right now during the pandemic. So some Ukrainians don't have a recognized uh, vaccine in Canada, so they would otherwise be uh, prohibited from entering, but that's being exempted. Um, and they're also being exempt from uh, needing to provide a medical, so an immigration medical outside Canada. Instead, they'll provide that medical once they're actually in the country. So who can apply uh, is pretty straightforward. It's Ukrainian citizens. And also it's open to immediate family members of a Ukrainian citizen. So in this case, think about a spouse or a partner who might who might be Romanian, for example, they, they are married to a Ukrainian, but they themselves are not Ukrainian yet, they don't have that citizenship. Uh, those immediate family members are being included in this process. So Canada is very um, adamant about keeping families united. And so this is reflected in the policy. So the biggest challenge, of course, is how do you actually go about applying? And I'm gonna go through some slides here. I've taken like some screenshots. If we have time later, I do have an active, like a portal that doesn't have a, it's like a dummy portal that we can look at if we have time. Um, but this is, um, all done online. There's a particular portal that people are using. So you need to sign up for a code, basically put your email address in, you create an account, and then you fill, on, fill in the online forms. Um, so this is the first 
the first page that you're going to kind of see. You're going to put in your email address, you're going to confirm your email address, and you're going to get this invitation code. Um, and I put the, and I'll let you um, circulate this, this PowerPoint later if you want, Katya. Um, so then we're going to sign into the account. This is literally what the page looks like. You're going to create a password, sign in. When you get into the portal, um, this, uh, this is kind of what the entrance, the first page looks like. So we'll have this little warning at the top. Um, it'll have an empty chart here at the bottom and a couple of links that you can click on. And what we're looking at is to apply uh, for the visitor visa. So pretty much everyone's gonna be clicking here, starting an application. Um, one of the first questions that it's gonna ask you is, are you applying for only one person or are you gonna apply for a group of people? So if you have a family, you're probably gonna to wanna to apply for those people all together so that everyone kind of gets processed at the same time and you're creating just one portal for them. So think about a mom and two kids or, or something like that, right? So we're gonna say in that case that we're applying for more than one person if it's just an individual, then they're going to click that yes, it's a, or sorry, no, it's just the one person. Now, if you do um, have a family, and I'm highlighting this because a lot of people will have sort of a group that they're applying for, it will create this um, sort of group chart. So this one you can see, um, I just started here. It This is a common uh, page of the application that you're going to see. Here you're going to see that you can add family members. So you'll add each person that's going to be included in the application by clicking on this add member button and it will add them into this group that you created. Um, now this one doesn't have any people in it yet uh, and you can see it's not complete. It says in progress. If I want it complete the application for that particular person, I'm going to click on continue with the little pencil button. And that's going to bring me into the actual application for that person. I'm going to start filling in actual app information about the person. Um, so the very first question is really important. Uh, it's going to ask you what you want to apply for. And so in this case, everyone's going to click the Canada Ukraine authorization for emergency travel. Once you select that option, it will bring up this these further questions automatically. So it's automatically gonna ask you basic like qualifying questions. Are you Ukrainian or are you a immediate family member of a Ukrainian? You're gonna fill that in. Um, and then the really important question here is, do you wanna work while you're in Canada? So I would make a note here that I suggest that any adult, so anybody over the age of 18, even to into their 90s, <laughs> Say yeah, I want to apply, I want to work permit in Canada. Right now, there's no age restriction on that. I mean, you, you're not going to have a student apply for it, like a minor, but any adult can apply for a work permit. And this is really important. We're going to talk about it later um, in terms of making sure that you can apply for Medicare coverage once you're in Canada. And so my suggestion is that everybody click yes here. Now, if for some reason you've already filled in your application or you did it before this process was um, available, don't panic because it doesn't mean it's not available for your, your family member to get a work permit. But if you're doing it now, I would suggest that any adult click yes, they want a work permit. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of every page, it will say save and continue. This is kind of like your guide through it. You're going to save all the information that you put in, everything that you click off and continue to the next page. You'll also notice that on each page is going to be an option to return to the group table. So that was the table of all the family members that you were putting in. So mom and kids, whoever is coming. Um, so you're always going to have that option to go back and look at what you've already done. Uh, and I going to make a final note on this sort of entrance page that most people won't have a unique client identifier. That is something that you would only have if you'd applied to immigration in the past. Um, and even if you have applied, you may not know what that number is. It's perfectly acceptable to leave that question blank. Um, the next page that you're going to see is going to be basically the government uh, pointing you towards what documents are absolutely required. So here you can see on this page, it's going to give you the heads up. We're going to need a passport or a travel document. 
and we're going to need you to prove your relationship to a Ukrainian if you're not Ukrainian. So that's for your spouse or whoever is not Ukrainian. Like that's one of their required documents because that's what they need to qualify for this particular process. Um, so that might be your marriage certificate. If it's a kid, it might be the birth certificate. So next you're going to go through that. You're going to press save and continue, and it will ask you a series of questions. So the, the topics that it's going to cover, it's going to ask you, do you have a representative? Or are you making this application by yourself? For some people, it might be that somebody else is helping them. They do have a representative. Um, a lot of people are just doing it for themselves as their own email account. Um, do you have, they're going to ask you for your travel document information. So that's like your passport number, when it was issued, your citizenship. If you have a national ID, it will want details of that. Have you used any names in the past? So that's like a maiden name, something like that. Where you've lived, where you've traveled, um, your education and work history. Uh, it will ask you if you've had biometrics already provided in the past. And we're gonna talk about biometrics in a little bit. It will ask you uh, about criminal and medical background. It will ask you for some family information your language, so what language you're comfortable in, what's your native language, and what language are you comfortable in, English or, or French. Um, it's also gonna ask you for contact information. And finally, um, if you've taken an immigration medical. And I just wanna make a note here on the immigration medical, that's not a medical um, that's just provided by like a family doctor, that's a particular thing that exists in immigration and so, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but it has to be completed by a particular panel physician um, and it is particular to immigration. So for most people, the answer to that question would be no. And that's fine because they're being exempted from having to provide that until they come to Canada. So I do want to make a note on biometrics. Um, biometrics is basically a photograph and, and fingerprints that the government will take. Um, and it's to help them um, keep track of identity. And so biometrics has been something that is slowing down some applications because so far the government has not exempted anyone from providing this photograph and these fingerprints for their, for their application. Um, so for most people, unless they've come to Canada uh, in the last, well, recently, then they, they will not have ever provided biometrics, so they will answer this question as no. Um, I also want to draw your attention to travel, the travel history questions and uh, the criminality and security questions. I'm not going to go through these, but um, it's really important that you read the questions carefully, and if you're not sure what it's asking, that you seek clarification from someone or, or help if, if, if English is not your first language. Um, read them carefully and answer them carefully. Uh, so in immigration, it's really important that your, your answers are consistent and that they're truthful. So, you know, don't, it's, it's better to say, yes, one time I applied for a visa to come to Canada and it was refused than to answer this incorrectly. Um, because it's quite serious in Canada, even though this is an expedited pathway to misrepresent or answer something falsely. So the same goes for the criminality and security questions. You know, you may be tempted to say, well, if I admit that 20 years ago I had a misdemeanor offense or I was charged with something and those charges were dropped, like I might not get to come to Canada. But if you answer yes to any of these questions, you will get a chance to explain um, what, what the charge was or what happened, uh, like a little box will show up. And so it's always better to just be really truthful here with these questions. Um, and so it's, I, I highlight them because I think it's important down the road that you've answered them consistently and honestly. You will get a chance for each person to review their, the, the answers that you've provided. So I encourage you to go in and look at that. Um, you can see here, um, you will have the chance to click on the pencil to edit each section. So you can go back through, change things, make sure you've got everything correct. It will bring you to a page to ask you to upload documents. And this is where you will um, 
you will basically upload the, the required documents. And a lot of people find this page intimidating because it has things listed here that you might not have and you might not need. So if you look here at supporting documents, not everybody, you might not have your national identity document, that's okay, you don't upload anything there, that's fine. You need to have a passport or a travel document again. If you have proof of funds, so a bank statement or a letter from a family member in Canada who's going to help you, like you know, you're going to stay with them for a few few weeks, that's great. You do not have to have that if you don't have it. So um, you'll see here also <clears throat> they're listing optional documents, an employer letter. I don't think. I don't think most people are going to have that. So I'm, you know, don't be intimidated by the fact that that option is there. You don't have to wait until you figure out a way to get an employer letter. Um, you don't have to have additional documents. The, the, the option here for a consent for personal information is interesting. If there is someone like a family member that you want to have access to your documents, you can fill in this use of representative form. So you'll see on this form, there's an option for you to say like, yes, Sally Shaw is gonna is my family member or my friend and I want her to be able to talk to immigration about my application. You can fill this in and sign it. But for a lot of people, you know, printing out and signing a document is maybe not an option. So, you know, lots of applications are being approved without that document. Um, and really honestly, with only a passport. Um, so when you go back to your group, you're going to fill in these, these detailed, uh, this detailed information for each person, so including children. So you'll add the member here to the group, and then you'll continue the application. When you filled in all the information and uploaded documents, you'll see that um, the little circle here that says in progress will actually turn to complete, and it'll be green. You'll get a chance to then submit the application. So kind of sign it electronically here by putting in your name. You will not be charged any fees. So it will show you that. Um, and then you'll get a confirmation that your application has been submitted. Another way to check now, I've sort of, this is a bit blurry because it's a, someone's actual portal that I've blurred out their names. But when you sign in now, you'll see your family and everybody will have an application number. Everybody's name will be listed here. I've whited these names out. And you'll see that all the applications have been submitted. Um, you can see here that you can click on check full application status. That's gonna be important because when you go in to look at the application, you'll get messages there um, asking you to do different things or to give your passport and, and, and confirmation that, that, that you've been approved by checking in on each person's status. Um, so here, when you click in, this is a sample page from one of, one of my clients, but you can see at the bottom here, if I check the status, it's listing all this correspondence at the bottom that's being sent to me. Now, you don't need to panic because you'll get an email notification if there's something for you to read. But if there is something for you to read or you wanna check it every morning, that's fine. You can sign in, check everyone's status and you'll scroll down and you'll see this little list of messages. So you can see here in this one, this person received a biometrics collection letter. And uh, you would open that up and it would actually be a letter. So uh, this is what a biometrics collection letter looks like. That's when you open that document, that's what it's going to look like. Um, so biometrics is the first big obstacle once you've submitted your application. Most people are getting the biometrics collection uh, request letter anywhere from an hour to a couple of days after they've submitted their application. So for most people, it's pretty immediate, but if it's not for you, don't panic. That doesn't mean there's something wrong. It can take a couple of days for whatever reason. So this is a request for you to give your photo and your fingerprints. It's going to be asked of everyone between the ages of 14 and 79 years old. So if someone in your family didn't get the request and they're outside of those ages, that there's no need to be concerned. They just don't have to give biometrics. Um, when you get this letter, you'll make an appointment to provide the biometrics at a visa application center. 
you'll bring the letter with you and your passport or your travel document, whatever you used for your identity, when you give your fingerprints and your photo. You'll be given 30 days to do this, but I would note not to panic if you can't give the biometrics within the 30 days. You can get an exemption and we, we've even been told like exemptions are going to be automatic. Um, so if you're in that situation, uh, we can talk about that, but um, you don't need to be worried about it. It is upsetting because it will delay your application some, but it doesn't mean your application is going to be refused. So the biggest question for people is, well, where do I go to give my biometrics? And I actually sent this link to Katya and, and it will be in this PowerPoint for you. Uh, but there is a list online on the government website where you can sort of type in different places and you, it, will, it will bring up where the closest um, visa application center is to you, which will then let you link to that application center and figure out how you make your appointment. So again, this is what the letter will look like. Um, for most people, I just have this here because most people are in Poland. Um, so in Poland, the visa application center is in Warsaw. This is a little snip of their website. You can see here they have a, a link to book an appointment. And when you click um, to book your appointment online, it'll bring you up to this um, login place where you can choose an appointment. Now, my tip on this is in Poland right now, when you first log in, to um, when you first log in to try to get an appointment, most people are finding that there isn't very many appointment spots. Um, the government is trying to open up more spots and put more people there all the time. So um, I've heard on several occasions that when they when someone first signed in, they couldn't get an appointment for several weeks, but they signed in at different times and eventually got an appointment within a couple of days. So it's worth checking and checking again to try to get an appointment that's a bit earlier. Um, so once you've given your biometrics, um, the last step then will be a request for your passport. Um, and so in some cases, they're asking for the passport to be brought in uh, when you give your biometrics, but that's not always the case. So you might get a separate letter in your portal saying, okay, now I need you to mail in your passport or physically bring it into the visa application center. Um, if you, and this is just, these pictures at the bottom are kind of what they look like, so you have an idea. Uh, the first one here is, uh, is the visa, that's the sticker that will go into the passport. The, the blurry one here is just a, a sample of what the single journey travel document will look like. And again, that's going to be the document that's given to people who don't have a passport right now. And that's going to let them enter the country. So you can see it has like a visa on it and a photo of them, sort of like a makeshift passport. So once you have these, you can travel to Canada, you can book your flight and come to Canada. Um, what will happen is you'll arrive at the port of entry. So for most people coming, let's say they're coming to Fredericton, their first port of entry to the Canada will probably be Toronto, maybe Halifax or Montreal. Like then they're going to catch a connecting flight here. So at their first port, they'll, they'll cross through um, Canada border services. And at Canada border services, they should be issued either the work permit, so the open work permit, or if they're children, they might be given either a study permit or a visitor record. And those should be valid. This is just what they'll look like. They're just paper documents on fancy paper. Um, and those should be valid for three years. So they'll have the date that they were issued and they should be given for at least three years. They'll have every, the person's name on it, um, but they won't be restricted by location in any way. Um, and, uh, and, and it's important that you note the, the validity date. Again, it's three years, but you do need to take note that that document, you need to maintain status at all times. So um, once they have these documents, uh, it might take a little while at the, at the actual border, but this is kind of the end of the process in terms of this emergency process. Um, and then they would continue on to their next flight or their final destination. So I do want to... Um, go over a few questions because I think there's lots of questions and frankly there's some things that we don't really know and I think the government's still figuring out but um, I'm going to go over a few things that have come up for me. Um, 
So the first question is, can someone who was not in Ukraine before the invasion still qualify? Um, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. There's no restriction at all that you have to be, have physically been in Ukraine for any period of time. So we have people from all over the world who are Ukrainian who um, are applying for this process to come to Canada. Um, again, you just have to be Ukrainian or an immediate family member of a Ukrainian citizen. So, <clears throat> and again, I guess that's the second question here. What if one of my family members is not Ukrainian? Again, the, the important thing here is that you prove the relationship to the person who is Ukrainian. So that might be a marriage certificate, for example. Um, this is a good question. And this is the most annoying part of the process uh, is giving biometrics. Again, as I mentioned so far, unfortunately, the government has not given any exemptions to biometrics. I know people have been asking for them. Um, but unfortunately, they've refused to, to budge on this point. It's uh, the, the reasoning is based in security. Um, what that means is if you're physically inside Ukraine when you're doing your application, you will need to get out of the country towards a place where you can give biometrics because you can't give biometrics all those offices are obviously closed inside Ukraine um, before you can get the approval for the visa. So it's really important to recognize in terms of planning um, to leave the country that you will need to leave the country to give biometrics before you get the visa approved. Um, usually it's not taking too long, but uh, I want you to be aware of that. So if your passport's expired or you don't have one, it doesn't matter. We've seen people get approved on uh, passports that have been expired for like 40 years. So it's not, it's not a problem. People that don't have passports have been approved. You really just need to have um, some, form of, some form of identity. Most people have sort of those internal passports. Uh, maybe have an expired passport, that's okay too. And just remember in that case, you won't get the visa in your passport, but you'll get that single journey uh, document. Oh, I did wanna say here, if you don't have a valid passport, it's likely that at the very end of the process, instead of giving your um, passport in to the visa application center, they'll ask you to bring in um, a photo. So they give you directions on how to have, or what that photo needs to look like. It's kind of like a little headshot, like a passport photo. Um, so this question is, can I come to Canada now if I already have a visa? And if so, what do I do next? So there are some people um, who have valid visas already. If you have a valid visa to come to Canada, you do not have to reapply through this process. You are eligible to enter Canada at this time. Um, so if you do that, my suggestion or my advice would be for that person to ask, still ask at the border for the visitor record or if they're an adult, ask for the open work permit. It should be issued to them regardless of how they got their visa originally. If they've already entered the country, don't worry, they can still apply online um, from inside Canada for the open work permit. So lots of Ukrainians were, even Ukrainians who were already here are, are doing that now. So how long will it take to get the visa? Right now, um, some applications are going really quickly, but their estimated processing time is 14 days from submission. But I do wanna note that that timing can be slowed down if you're not able to provide bi biometrics um, because they can't complete the process until you, after you give the biometrics. Um, oh, does my kid need a study permit? So usually minor children coming from Ukraine would apply for study permits. Um, they will be given study permits at the border is my understanding. They may also be given a visitor record simply at, at the border. Either will be fine if they're um, going to elementary school or high school or middle school, sort of like minor children. Um, as long as the parent has an open work permit, if they have a visitor record, it won't be a big deal. They should probably be given uh, study permits, but if they have only a visitor record, that's fine too. 
Now, older children are a little bit more of a problem because uh, they actually have to have a study permit to attend sort of higher education institutions, so to go to a university or a college. Um, and so they will need to get accepted to the school and apply for a study permit. But there is a process for them to be able to do that as well. And I should have linked it here. I can add the link here before I send out the PowerPoint. So the one question that we get all the time is what documents do I need? Again, you need the passport you need, or a travel document. You might need evidence of the relationship to the Ukrainian family member if you're not Ukrainian. Um, I recommend if you can that you provide some sort of proof of funds like a bank statement or a letter from your family in Canada. Again, this is not required and lots of people are being approved without it, but if you can get it, great. Optional is that uh, the use of representative form that I mentioned, a consent form from the non-traveling parent. Um, in, some, in normal cases, that would be something that's required for a child who's, for example, their dad is not coming with them. Um, but what we've been told and what's happening is that they're not really enforcing that part of, of the process because um, in, in many cases it would be impossible to get, to get a letter of consent. So um, that is not a document that is required uh, at this point based on what we're seeing in processing. Um, I note here that if you do need to upload any documents that are not in English or French, you will need to have those translated. So they can either be done by a certified translator or it can be done also uh, by someone who's not a family member who signs an affidavit off that they've translated uh, the document. For the most part, because so few documents are really required, unless you have something very specific that you think is required, like um, maybe you had a criminal charge dismissed against you and you actually have that decision, that would be a document that I would generally say, okay, this might be worth getting translated. Or maybe you have a child who you're going to bring with you, but neither of the parents are coming, then you definitely want some sort of consent from at least one of the parents, right? So in some cases, there may be a document you want translated. And so I would look into that. I know that there, there are people around that are helping with translation. Um, will I have Medicare coverage? So this is a big one. And this is the reason that I suggest everybody apply for open work permits that possibly can. In New Brunswick, you'll need to have a work permit and proof that you're residing in the province in order to be eligible for Medicare coverage right now in, can in, in New Brunswick. Um, and again, so far, there's no restrictions. So lots of Older people who have no intention on working in Canada are still applying for that open work permit and definitely that's what I would encourage them to do. Uh, do you need a job offer to ask for the open work permit? Absolutely not. You don't have to have any prospects of a job whatsoever to request the work permit. You do not have to provide any evidence of past employment or your education history. Really, um, it's just an open permit. They're not looking at any of those requirements. Uh, if you want to, there is the link on Job Bank where employers who are interested in hiring Ukrainians are supposed to be listing their jobs. So I put the link here, but you absolutely do not need to know that you're going to work or where you're going to work or have a job offer. Uh, this is a question that's come up a few times. When do I have to travel to Canada if I get the visa? Um, that is a good question. There's no timeline really on the visa. It's given as a multi-entry visa. So um, really you do have some time to get here. The part that we don't know is how long Canada would be honoring the open, the issuing of the open work permit. I, 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 said, I think that it will be for quite a while, but um, you know, if you're thinking about not coming to Canada for a year or two, um, really I'd be careful of that because we don't know how long this temporary measure will be in place. Um, and this is a big question and I think we'll get into this in later sessions maybe as we learn some more news about pathways and programs that they're announcing. But one question that comes up is, okay, I'm coming to Canada, but how do I stay here in Canada? So one thing to make sure is that you always maintain your status. Um, 
so you're going to have three years of uh, three years initially, but you're going to have to make sure that you do something to be able to stay if you want to stay longer than that. Um, if for some reason you had family members that came in earlier in February or they just weren't issued a document, that's okay, but they will want to apply to get that open work permit or the visitor visa, some, some document to maintain their status here. When you don't get anything, you're allowed to stay for six months, but you wanna stay for longer than that, obviously. Um, we're waiting on details about a sort of family sponsorship program that's gonna be unique for Ukrainian families. So when we get those details, we'll provide you more information. We don't know yet what that's gonna look like. And that would be for people to obtain permanent residency to stay here long term. And then another note here that some people, you know, that come here and get jobs, there are very good programs that the province of New Brunswick especially has to sort of help those people uh, stay in the province. And so it's possible that they might apply through some of those other programs. Um, so I took up most. Of, I took up most of our time, but I will. I'll. Uh, I'll ask if there's questions. I have a couple questions, Brittany. If it's okay. Yeah. Um, the first one is. I guess I put it in the chat. Um, is there any point that they won't be able to applicants? won't be able to move on if they can't answer some of the questions no you can well so it will sort of stop you if you haven't answered a required question um but you should be able to flip through and see them if you sort of put something in and turn the page um but uh yeah, it won't it won't stop you, but I think it does notify you if you have failed to fill in something that's required. Okay, can I ask a follow up question? Mm -hmm. um, proof of funds. Yeah. So, is there an amount that an applicant needs a minimum yeah. amount? And um, no. <laughs> and. and Okay, there okay. normally would be you're absolute the norm the normal idea is okay you're coming for a short period of time and how do i know that you're going to have enough money to stay here for that time and pay to go home but because this is so such a unique situation um they're asking for funds it comes up but if really there's no cutoff so so they could essentially just upload whatever information they have which is even even a personal letter or a letter from the, the support in Canada anything would get them to the next stage in the application is that what yeah yeah and actually the documents um it won't stop you so if you okay. just upload a passport you'll still be able to go back fill in all your other information the documents won't stop you from filling anything in if you don't so a lot of people kind of put all the information about their family members in first and then they go in and put everybody's documents because it's the same documents you know if you if you do have proof of funds you know if i have a bank statement i upload my bank statement for myself and my two kids but again, really the funds, it's there and it, it looks intimidating. And we say, if you have funds, throw it in there, but lots of people are being approved without any proof of funds. Okay, thank you. Um, Katie, I see your question here about older children applying for the study permit. I believe that the study permit is free as well. Jason, you might actually know that better than me. <laughs> I haven't done one yet. I think it is also free, whereas normally you'd have to pay for it. The study permit for the CUEAT? Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. All I heard from Immigration Canada was it was the same as the open work permit. It'll, it'll yeah. be issued. Um, but uh, international students that are li living in Ukraine that want to study um will have to apply for the study they'll have to get a letter of acceptance and apply for the study permit they'll probably have to pay for the fees as i don't think they would qualify under the cuaet so we may get yes. some applicants yeah. from who are international students that for whatever reason can't go home or can't can't leave and, and go to their own country of origin so 
Yeah, that's a really good point. That might be something to look at, Jason, uh, with UNB and with St. Thomas, whether they would be willing to waive the fees for uh, Ukrainians coming through <clears throat> this time. The, the application fees for, for getting the letters of acceptance or the... No, the, either to provide some sort of um, bursary or to waive the international student fees. Like I remember, you know, with other big movements, universities some try, sometimes tried to create spaces or seats for Syrians, for example, or Kosovars in the university. So it just might be something worth uh, discussing to see whether there was some possibility there. Yeah, I can definitely see um, bursaries being given to cover uh, study permit fees for sure. At least that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, at the visa application centers, uh, Brittany, are there what kind of help are they receiving from representatives and is there the French English translation that many will need for say banking documents? Um, so the visa application centers don't provide the translation. Uh, so really if, if you have someone that needs translation, um, I, I think there was someone in the community and, and I actually have another uh, person in the Atlantic provinces that's providing some translations. Um, and so we can get those but the VAX won't do it for you. I think the, the visa application centers are pretty good in terms of um, calling people or emailing them when their passports are ready and they can come in and get them and those types of things. So they are trying to be helpful, but they're not really helping them do any part of the application other than like collecting things that they need to submit and, and, and handing them back out. Sure, yeah. We, we learned it was about between Warsaw and Krakow, there's something like 40,000 expected applicants for this program. So I don't know if that's accurate or not. That's a lot, but. Yeah. And I mean, I, I do think like a lot of people sort of, if you wanted to, you could sign up for, if, if, if you were thinking about applying for this, you could probably sign up for a, a, a biometrics appointment and I think a lot of people did that before they had their request letters and so that's why you are seeing some cancellations because you can't go to your appointment unless you have the letter and whether I whether or not you choose to sort of make that appointment you don't have to have the letter to make the appointment um, so some people are doing that and hedging that you know the biometrics letters really are coming pretty fast once you submit so some people think that's worth trying. Um, there was discussion about them setting up mobile biometrics units, which I think um, they've used in the past in other situations. But to my knowledge, what they're doing is just sending more people and trying to make more appointments at the existing visa application centers. For uh, one week, they had um, applications actually at the visa office. So what happens is the visa application center is the office where all the documents come in and then they actually send them out to a visa office to actually have the stamps and immigration officers that work for the government actually review things. Um, they were making appointments at the embassy at one point, but I don't think that they're doing that now. Thank you. Um, so Katia, if you want to, um, if there was other questions that we didn't get to, or is there? I think at this point we've covered all of them, even the question that we have uh, received in the group uh, regarding someone applying for this program who lives abroad, who used to live abroad before the war started. And I believe you have replied that question in your PowerPoint already. Yeah, I think uh, all of the questions have been covered. So this is great. It's very helpful. We're going to uh, make this available on our YouTube channel and share with our clients who were not able to attend tonight. Um, we also want to remind um, everyone to join uh, the same link, same meeting information that was shared previously to register. 
can be used to register for the coming Tuesdays. We want to try to have these for the next uh, few weeks, uh, at least till the end of the month. Um, if new information comes on uh, regarding the family reunification program or any updates about the existing pathway or changes that could be added there onto those sessions and people can ask questions that may have come up as they were filling out the applications for their friends and family. So if you guys don't have any additional questions here in the call, I apologize for a little disconnect. Internet is shaky again, <laughs> but I think uh, we did great for today and, and this is really helpful, Brittany. Thank you so much for putting the presentation together. And um, if you could send us the PowerPoint as well, and we'll have that available to distribute to the community members. I just want to also say thank you, Brittany. Thank you, very good information. Good, okay. Well, if more questions come up through the week, you can send them to me and then we decide what we'll be talking about on Tuesday. Sounds good. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, bye.